Indiana, as Emma mentioned, is 11 and 5 in Big Ten play. They want to lock up a first round bye for the Big Ten tournament and a sweep here in Jersey. Who would do them well. Yesterday, the 9 0 victory in five innings. The day before that, a 7 3 win. And the numbers this weekend from Cora Bassett and company have been overwhelming at the plate. As Gamsby misses upstairs 2 0. Bassett was on base all four times in her four at bats yesterday with just that one hit. She scored two times. She had a nice double. But so many players in this Indiana lineup can get on base in so many different ways. They're known for their power. We will talk at length about how potent this offense is, especially in conference play. But the eye is so patient at the plate, and that's where they've been able to hurt Rutgers throughout this series. Yeah, so far this weekend, we've played 12 innings of softball, and in those... Indiana has produced 34 base runners, 16 hits, 15 walks, and a couple of hit by pitches as well. As Gamsby gets the strike call on the outer edge, two and two. And the remarkable thing is that that was exactly where Indiana was struggling coming into this series. They weren't getting on base as much. They weren't able to put base setters on for the meat of this lineup, the Kearns, the Minnicks, the Stones. And here, over the last three days, you've just seen their patience at the plate be impeccable. And head coach Shonda Stan, she still wants more. She wants this sweep this afternoon. Yeah, it's never easy to sweep road series in Big Ten play, especially with the level that the Big Ten is at this year. But a chance for the Hoosiers to do that is Cora Bassett spoils a foul. But for Rutgers, this has still been an outstanding season, 30-19 uh, and 19 overall, down to 7-9 and nine in Big Ten play. And this is their first 30-win season in a decade. They're trying to get off the seven-game losing streak they've been on. And Bassett flips this to center field. Morgan Smith drifting back and uh, drifted a whole long way back to the warning track. And you can already see, if you've joined us for other games this weekend, the wind not blowing in as it has the first two days. It's blowing out a bit more. And with two really talented lineups, that's just favorable conditions for a whole lot of home runs. For both teams, hopefully we see a lot of offense today. But yeah, that one, there was a, a ball hit by Sarah Stone yesterday that would have been a home run absolutely on a day like today. And Cora Bassett is probably wishing that she put that type of barrel on a ball yesterday because that more than likely would have been out. And now the most talented freshman in the Big Ten, Taryn Kern. Uh, what a weekend she has had. You see the numbers this year. Big Ten leader in homers and RBI. Already set the Indiana school record for homers in a single season. This is her first season of college softball. But this weekend, she's come to the plate eight times, and she has reached base six of those. Yeah, it's no surprise that Taylor Kern, or t excuse me, Taryn Kern is getting on base at the rate that she's been getting at. It's been happening all year long. There seemingly was no adjustment for her from the high school to college level. She has just worked so seamlessly into this lineup in the two hole. And she actually got some pitches to hit yesterday and she did damage with them in her last at bat. She was able to get an RBI, scored, put the, fin the finishing touches on Indiana's win, but you can definitely see the Rutgers coaching staff implementing a strategy here to not give the two, three, four hitters in this Indiana lineup much to hit. And right on cue, it's a three and one count to Kern, the native of San Jose, California. But already, Ramey Gamsby, who's also from out west, she's from the Napa Valley. Already she has done something Rutgers has not been able to do yet this weekend, which is retire the first hitter of the game. As Curran lifts this deep in the sky to left. See you later. The record grows for Taryn Kern. It's her 19th home run this freshman season. And the Hoosiers once again strike in the first. It's just unbelievable how she is pacing this lineup. We talked to Shonda Stan pregame, and she was so excited about some of her players being close to 10 home runs. Taryn Kern is now one away from 20 on the season, and she just absolutely launched this ball the opposite way. No doubt, and the left fielder knew it, and that is opposite field power. She does everything so well, and 
that power is just going to continue to come in bunches. And you can see now why Rutgers pitchers have tried to stay away from her so far this series. Now we were wondering when Taryn Kern would make the mark in this series that she has in others. Talked about how she's gotten on base a lot this weekend, had the RBI single in her last at-bat yesterday. But no extra base hits. Rutgers has been very careful to work around the zone. The other five times she's reached this weekend were on walks and hit by pitches. Right there, Oppo Taco for Kern as Taylor Minnick takes out of the zone 2-0. So often with hitters of her caliber of talent, they're so eager to get into the box and swing it as much as they can that it's unique to see a batter like her with that type of power paired with the eye and the patience that she has in the box. A pitch from Gamsby. That's a little above the letters, and so it's ball three. And this is an important start for Gamsby, like you mentioned, getting herself back on track in conference play, but to try and salvage this win for Rutgers as well. And already she's struggling getting ahead of hitters early. You're not going to be able to completely stop this offense that is just too potent, but throwing strikes and trying to get ahead as she walks Minnick there. It's definitely something that Georgia Ingle and Jaden Vickers tag-teaming that game yesterday struggled with. Puts a pinch runner on first. That's Cassidy Kettleman. Just always never relenting, always trying to get as much out of it as she can. And Cassidy Kettleman, who we've talked about a lot being an offensive hero in game one, now she's on the base pass. So just a, a plethora of talent and, and success to work with for Stanton's group. And that's back in the zone for Gamsby, one and one. Well, Gamsby pitched twice this past weekend, but Rutgers lost on the road to Penn State. Made the start in the finale of the series and struggled. Gave up six runs in two and two thirds innings of work. Now, really, the last five outings for Gamsby have been a bit difficult. But at the same time, at one point midway through this season, Gamsby had a sub two ERA, and she still boasts the best start that a Rutgers pitcher has had in conference action so far. It came against Illinois, in fact. Very good team. A big rip and a miss there from Stone at a soft earth throwing Gamsby, and a count two and two. She definitely has swing and miss stuff. The issue with getting behind these hitters is that she's putting them in hitters' counts, and these Indiana pitchers don't usually miss the really good pitches. So the debacle there is throwing them strikes in the first place, and we've seen a lot of different Indiana hitters in this lineup do damage. But it's been a pitcher-by-committee approach all season long for Rutgers, and it's just expounded upon today with Ramey, Ramey Gamsby, Vickers and Ingle, Yesterday on Friday, Hitchcock. Payoff. It slowly rolled to the left side. Linkavich, great cutoff, and they are not able to turn two. Oh, it was close. But well done, though, by Peyton Linkavich to retire the speedy Kettleman at second. If Sand is left to field that ball, Stone might have even reached. Oh, absolutely. And it was close right there. Nice head first slide by Kettleman as the pinch runner. The ball was hit so softly off the end of Stone's bat that she actually made that much harder for the Rutgers defense than it needed to be. And now Bree Copeland, who cracked her ninth home run of the season yesterday. And I say it like that because Top to bottom, this is a talented Indiana roster. And they have Kern, who's now got 19 home runs, but they've got three more players, Copeland included, one home run shy of the double-digit total. And it just goes to show you how remarkable the power output has been for Copeland and for the Hoosiers this year, as she does fall behind 0-2. 
And you can definitely see the strategy already for Gamsby. She's trying to paint that outside corner. She's gotten the calls so far. Her pitch. And it's bounced up there. Good block by Winger. Even the pitch to Kern. She painted that on the outside corner. Kern was just able to take it the opposite way. She's trying to elicit as much weak contact as possible, something that Indiana hasn't done a lot of, and that's why they've been able to score so many runs in so few innings. The one-two. This has been a pesky Hoosier lineup as well. Lots of adjectives to describe them this weekend. Patient. We know they're powerful, but pesky. Now, one of the reasons why Indiana struck for seven runs in the first three innings yesterday is because they were able to foul off two strike pitches Work walks and then end up with good pitches that they could hit. And now two and two as Stone scrambles back to first. And that's why Vickers' start yesterday was so interesting because she threw so many pitches because Indiana was working such good counts. She only gave up three hits on the day. Six runs, that five walks is what really sticks out to me. Just having a tough time finding the strike zone and giving Indiana extra opportunities on the base pass. Copeland into the gap, and it drops in for a base hit. It goes all the way to the wall. Stone now around third. She's headed home. Sand the cutoff throw. It's high, and Stone scores. And now Copeland heads for third. An extra base hit for Bree Copeland, and Indiana scores two to start the ball game. I mean, almost a, an exact replica of the ball that Copeland hit yesterday that traveled just a bit further and over that outfield wall, but she gets a three-bagger out of it. Morgan Smith in center field did not have a great route on that ball, which allowed Stone to score all the way from first base. And then Rami Gamsby also was not backing up home plate. So once that ball sailed over Winger's head, Stone, uh, excuse me, Copeland was able to take third base. All right, now a chance for one more with Avery Parker, who's red hot, standing at the plate. Sort of an awkward swing there, strike one. Well, I say Parker is red hot because of all the players in this Indiana lineup, the power hitters and the Big Ten brand names, it's Avery Parker, believe it or not, the freshman leading the team with a 409 batting average in league play. Any ball that got lofted into the air yesterday was going to be brought back by that win, so keeping it on a line drive was the best way to get on base. And we've talked so much about Indiana's offense and Rutgers, again, another error in this inning, two yesterday. But their offense needs to show up today. They were shut out yesterday for the third time in their last five games. Two of those came against Penn State, which were very low-scoring games anyway. But they have to score early and often to compete against a lineup like Indiana's. Yeah, that's sort of the other side to Indiana's great weekend thus far is for all the accomplishments of the offense, the two starters were very good. And we saw Macy Montgomery, who's starting today for Indiana, pitch in relief on Friday. Yeah, pitched quite well. Now yesterday, Heather Johnson, a uh, five-inning complete game shutout, the first complete game shutout that an Indiana pitcher has thrown this year. Here's a three and one to Parker. And it's ball four. And that was a huge comeback outing for Heather Johnson, only giving up three hits. Not a ton of hard contact to show. Definitely needed that in conference play with Indiana on the track to get one of the four seeds in the conference tournament. You know, that they Coming down to the wire here with just a few more series to end water. the regular season. And in Rutgers' case, it's just supplying the offense to back up what these pitchers are doing in the circle. And now the hometown kid, Lindsey Warwick from South Brunswick, New Jersey. And halfway to second goes Parker. She's there, the throw back home, and Copeland is out. 
Little delayed double steal from Indiana, but Rutgers snuffs it out. Absolutely, and this, this Rutgers lineup has really succeeded all year long. They've been so quieted by Indiana pitching so far, and when you look at the difference between these two offenses, it's really just reps at this point. The majority of Indiana's lineup saw four at-bats yesterday compared to the top of the lineup seeing just two times through for Rutgers. So trying to see as many good pitches as they can as Sand just gets out of the way of that high pitch. But it, it starts at the top. It, it's, it's Sand and Linkavich leading this Rutgers offense here. They need to get on base early so that Morgan Smith, Katie Winger, Maddie Lawson are in RBI situations. And Sand fouls that back. So it's two and one. And you really can't overstate how important that inning ending play at the plate was for Rutgers to get out of that inning. Runners on the corners, Warwick up, the bottom of the lineup for Indiana has produced all series long and just not a great jump off of third base and Sand with the perfect throw and Winger was able to, to hold on. You could see that ball was just at the tip of her glove. So well executed by Rutgers defense. A two and two against Sands, and on base percentage of 454. And she smashes this to left field. Kettleman drifting back and finds it on the warning track. And again, the wind blowing out to left. And here's Peyton Linkavage, a 285 hitter, who has flexed some of her muscle in Big Ten play and become Rutgers' best hitter in league action. Six home runs and 15 RBI against Big Ten teams. And I think you can already tell in the course of just five or six pitches here that Rutgers hitters are being much more aggressive. They're letting these counts go a little bit longer. I think that was definitely one of their downfalls yesterday. Heather Johnson pitched a complete game shutout with under 50 pitches. So the at-bats were just so short. Rutgers has to be more patient at the plate, let some strikes go by. And Lynn Cabbage already putting up a nice battle here with some foul balls. And Montgomery lost that, so the count's two and two. And maybe a change of approach from Rutgers, which is a team that prides itself on being aggressive at the plate. But so far this weekend, eight hits over the 12 innings. And Montgomery misses low and away, so the count goes full. Montgomery's 11th start of the season. She has the opportunity here to, to bring down that ERA a little bit. Oh, strike three. When Cabbage was frozen, and Montgomery collects her first strikeout. In the two spot, try and put her team on the board. We saw Heather Johnson do a nice job of that yesterday, too, changing the eye level, throwing a, a multitude of pitches to keep these Rutgers hitters off balance, and it was very effective. And now Smith cracks this on the ground. Copeland knocks it down and completes the play at first. So it's a 1-2-3 start to the ball game for Macy Montgomery. And the Hoosiers have a two-run advantage after one. They'll send the bottom third of their order to the plate as Lindsey Warwick drives this down the line and it's a foul ball. Yeah, you can definitely tell these balls are hit much harder than they were yesterday. And without that win, they're really getting some distance on them. So we had a feeling there was going to be a lot of offense today, and it looks like we're, we're going to get our wish. Anyway, Gamsby threw 34 pitches in the first inning, but gets ahead of Warwick, nothing in two. Yeah, I mean, it hasn't played out like that this weekend, but entering this series... And we thought this would be a who scores last kind of weekend. Both teams entered the weekend top 50 in the country and top four in the Big Ten in runs per game. And they combined to average more than 12 runs per contest. Strike three. 
When Ramey Gamsby is rocking, she's a strikeout pitcher, and that's her first punch out of the day. Yeah, and hopefully this starts to get her a little bit of momentum, get her in her groove here. Just a really nice at bat. She started with off-speed pitch, and then she was able to paint that on the inside corner. Nothing war can do with that pitch. But yet, uncharacteristically, Rutgers' offense has been silenced by a pitching staff on Indiana that had struggled. And now Kinsey Mitchell sends that to Taylor Fawcett. And it's two quick outs for Gamsby, exactly what she needs here in the second. Of course, this lineup does taper off a little bit after Avery Parker. So this is where, and it's exactly what she's doing, Gamsby needs to come in, throw as few pitches as possible, elicit some weak contact before the lineup turns over to Cora Bassett. And now Brooke Benson, the shortstop, tries to bunt and fouls it off. Now we were talking earlier too about how Ramey Gamsby can still claim the best Big Ten start that Rutgers has had this year. Came way back on opening weekends. Rutgers at Illinois ended up sweeping the series. Best weekend in Big Ten play this year for RU, at least to this point. And Gamsby in her conference debut Pitched a complete game shutout. And it was a seven inning complete game shutout. And Benson did not offer on that swing. So it's a one and one count. And seven scoreless, scattered six hits, struck out seven. And that remains her season high. And her pitch. Wave and a miss. The off-speed stuff has been fooling the Hoosiers over the last couple of plate appearances. Absolutely. You can tell that that's really working for her right now. Down in the zone, changing the timing for these pitchers, and now it allows, it gives her so many more options this next pitch with two strikes to go high and away with a fastball, down in the zone again. And it's impressive for Gamsby to, to have, regardless of success, to have the conference experience under her belt going further in her college career, but to have the success paired with it and to lead her team to a lot of wins with the offense behind her. Great start for the young pitcher. Trying to put away Benson. And that's popped up. And a great try by Winger. She makes the catch. Katie Wingert somehow battling the fence and the sun makes the play to end the inning. Just a great jump from Wingert. Uses the wall as a help, actually. Really impressive, and Ramey Gansby is able to get out of it. Was her first one, two, three inning of the afternoon. Uh, Gamsby out of the inning quickly and allows herself to now go up here and do some damage on this side. A lot of the talk with Katie Wingert, too, now a fifth-year senior, is about her bat. Obviously had the outstanding freshman campaign in 2019, 18 home runs, it was all Big Ten and all region. But one of the sort of under-discussed parts of her game is her defense. This year entered the weekend leading the conference in runners caught stealing, 11 of them. Has to work with six different pitchers, which Rutgers mixes in every weekend, it seems like. Young pitchers at that as well, that to have that experience and leadership behind the plate at one of the more important positions on the field. Oh, it's misplayed by Copeland, and Wingert will reach. A bit of a difficult play to Copeland's right, and it took a late hop towards her, so we'll see how it's scored. But Rutgers, regardless, has its first base runner. Yeah, and this is just an encouraging start for the offense, getting hard contact off the bat. And bunts it. It sits in front of the plate. Warwick to first, retires Lawson by a step. Petered out before it could roll down the line much. All right, regardless, here's the spot for Taylor Fawcett, who's batting 370 this season with runners in scoring position. And that's the case here with less than two outs. I think at this part of the lineup, 
Lawson laying down that sack bunt. Now there's only one out in the inning, runner in scoring position, trying to, to help the transition for this Rutgers offense that has struggled over its last two games. Oh, what a great pitch from Montgomery. Pulls the string. Strike two. Both pitchers showing off their off-speed stuff so far today. Very effective. The pitch, and Fawcett blasts it, but foul. And that's impressive that she was able to get to that ball. Again, the whole point of that off-speed stuff is to make the fastball look even faster, and it definitely looked like that. She was actually ahead of that pitch, just, just fouled on the left field line. Montgomery's pitch, swing and a miss. Dials up the heat for her second strikeout of the day. Place. And it results in her second strikeout of the day. Uh, talking to Shonda Stanton, the head coach of Maryland, or head coach of Indiana, excuse me. She said Montgomery is a pitcher who can work in every zone. And we've seen the difference that she gets on her fastball and her off-speed stuff in these first two innings. And she works at every at-bat, too. We've seen her start ahead of hitters. We've seen her start behind. That one just missed. Looked like she had that one. It's now 3-0. and But she, she's not scared by, by being behind, behind in a count. She's able to make her pitches. She's also not, throw, not afraid to throw off-speed late in a count as she did right there to get herself back in it. Yeah, Kayla Bach taking all the way. Opportunities now for Rutgers in scoring position are going to be essential now. And Bach sends this to center field. Here comes Winger, the throw, the tag, she's out! What a throw by Kinsey Mitchell! She downs Winger at the plate and ends the second inning with a bullet. It needed to take a perfect throw, and that is exactly what Mitchell did on the fly. Perfect tag applied by Warwick. And wow, her momentum carried her the whole way, and it does look like she applied the tag before the foot got in there. And now the top of the order is at the plate for the Hoosiers with a chance to seize on the momentum that they've built over the first two innings. It just feels like everything is going in Indiana's favor over these three-game series. Today, Rutgers' offense has looked much better. They're putting together better at-bats. They're not swinging at pitches outside of the zone, and they're still just struggling to get that first run across the board. Cora Bassett sends that into the seats. Good grab by an Indiana fan up the first baseline. And the count now two and one. That really has been that weekend for Indiana. When we talk about their Big Ten record, 11-5. Still two weekends to go for both of these teams. Two weekends left for Big Ten softball before the conference tournament begins. Indiana will have Michigan next weekend, and that is a notable one with Michigan joining the Hoosiers in the top four of the conference, and then Michigan State to close out. But getting a sweep here, getting, getting to 12 wins would do wonders for their ability to stay in the top four and just avoid that first day of the tournament. Absolutely, and for Rutgers, this is potentially facing a top two team in the top two team in the conference. So nothing to, to stay down over. It's just trying to, to eke out some momentum going into their upcoming series. Sand boots it. Hot shot to her right. And Cora Bassett. Reaches base safely to begin the third. Tough play to judge there for Sand. Was just on the bounce, kind of on the line, and the ball just, just booted away. But another piece of hard contact for Indiana. And yeah, once again, Cora Bassa is on base Kura. in front of Kern to set this Indiana lineup in motion. Well, that's what happened the first time Taryn Kern came to the plate today. Smashed her 19th home run of the season. A Big Ten leading mark and also her Big Ten best 56th RBI, which puts her near the top of the country. 
That has been an otherworldly freshman season for Taryn Kern. I thought what was most telling too, and we caught up with Shonda Stanton this week, was what she said comparing Kern to other players she's coached. You know, we asked her, have, is there any other rookies or f freshmen in your time, 25 years she's been a head coach, Shonda Stanton, uh, across the college game, she's coached in the pros as well. And she said there's only one that really sticks out a former, full, a four-time All-American, Rachel Fulton. I thought it was remarkable. And now the hitting instructor for the Cubs and comes back to the team and consults. Yeah, what great advice there. And, and what a comparison. I mean, Kern is definitely on that track. She's, you mentioned yesterday, doesn't really seem like it's up to, for debate that she's going to be the conference freshman of the year she's the all-star on this Indiana team and you see that she's just going to get fewer and fewer pitches to hit because she does so much damage with the ones that she does get and the fact that she was able to take that pitch on the outside corner in the first at bat she has established all parts of the zone that's a four pitch walk for Curran so now and this is Taylor Minnick who comes back to the plate, replaces Cassidy Kennelman, who pinch ran for her earlier. That's ball one. By the way, too, mentioned Rachel Folden as the only comparison in Shonda Stanton's time. It's somebody who became the first female coach in Chicago Cubs history when she was hired back in 2019 as a hitting instructor. It was a four-time All-American at Marshall in the Hall of Fame there and went on to play pro softball for five seasons. So that's a pretty good comparison, let's say. So cool to see that. <laughs> and the experience she must get from the Cubs team to be able to bring back to this Indiana team, it's just such valuable knowledge for everybody involved, really. Yeah, during the offseason, we'll come back to Indiana softball, do some instructional things with their hitters, and well, whatever instruction has been provided by whatever coach, <laughs> it's worked out so far this year in a record-setting season for the Hoosiers. Already smashed the school record for homers and RBI this season and on pace to break a whole lot more with now possibly a month or more of softball left in Indiana's future. And years to come with this young core. Oh, wow. It's a mile high and a mile long foul ball. That might have been the farthest ball we've seen hit this series. Just happened to stay foul, but... Yeah, I mean, we, I think we just all have to keep reminding ourselves that the majority of this Indiana lineup are underclassmen. So this young core is so primed for success now, they're only going to keep improving as time goes on, and that's when we're really going to see those accomplish accomplishments grow and grow. 2-2. Two -two. Now, Ramey Gamesby still looking for the first out here in this third inning as Cora Bassett reaches on a single, and then Taryn Kern earns a four-pitch walk. And if Minnick gets on, Sarah Stone, who cleared the bases with a triple yesterday, would get another chance with the bags full. And it's ball four. And Katie Winger with a shout out to Gamsby. She liked the pitch, just didn't like the call. Looks back and regrets the amount of walks issued. It was nine in, in game one. I believe it was six in game two, and that total is rising here in game three. Was that the preferred outcome, or would she rather that Indiana gets pitches to swing at? They're obviously prone to do damage there. I wonder how that's going to be looked back upon with hindsight, obviously, because it's just so hard to pitch around these hitters. Well, it's a question that I think a lot of teams have asked themselves during, before, and after playing Indiana this year. Absolutely. How do you deal with them? You can't pitch to them, and after a little while, you can't pitch around them. And the bases are loaded for Sarah Stone with the infield in. And the count's two and one. And Stone this weekend has six RBI so far. She's been the big run producer. The craziest thing at all is that when we were catching up with Shonda Sand, she, she still feels like there was some stuff left on the table. Obviously a huge 
impact going into this game, trying to be more patient at the plate as that one is fouled back. They've been doing that in bunches by drawing so many walks. Even hit by pitches have led to on-base opportunities. And she still feels like there's more in this Indiana lineup, which is very scary for their remaining opponents. Yes. <laughs> It does just feel like it's always on stone here with these huge, potentially game-changing at-bats. And she's cashed in so far. Yeah, it wasn't just the triple yesterday. Drove in the first two runs of the series with a two-run single herself. But now Gams being a 2-2 count, and the freshman's pitch is looped foul. And it gets out of play. Gamsey is still doing a good job working these uh, working these counts, working these at bats. Sarah Stone in the first inning had that little dribbler. She was able to get on base with a fielder's choice, but she's eliciting some weak contact by mixing up the pitch placement. That's a foul ball. base hit here scores at least two. Another 2-2 two -two pitch. Ball three. Indiana trying to capitalize on the big inning potential of this third. Gamsby in search of an out. And it's pop foul. Every at bat, just such a tough out, and it doesn't relent with the home run leader from yesterday, Bree Copeland, waiting on deck. Avery Parker beside her. It's probably going to be another joint effort for this Rutgers pitching staff this afternoon. We saw Georgia Ingle get out of a bases loaded zero out situation yesterday. Gamsby obviously looking to follow in her footsteps here. Bassett at third, Kern at second, Minnick at first. Here's the payoff. And it's slammed to center field. Smith freezes, makes the catch. Here comes Bassett, the throw, a hopper, she's safe. Bassett's in on the sacrifice fly. Kern also goes to third, and Indiana now leads by three. Hard contact doing exactly what she needed to do, which is put the ball in play, put the ball in the air. And despite a really great jump from Smith, obviously, the, the throw is just a little bit too late, and because it wasn't cut off, Kern is able to advance to third. Again, just really smart base running by this entire Hoosier team, and they extend their lead. Seventh RBI of the series for Sarah Stone. And what does she come to the plate? Ten times? Nine times? As Brie Copeland fouls it back. Yeah, the phrase around Indiana is game leaders. Now you've got your season leaders, your captains, your veterans. There are not a whole lot of seniors on this Indiana team with all of their youth that we've discussed. But who will lead us game by game? Well, this weekend it's been Stone. And that's a really important distinction that a lot of these players on Indiana aren't too experienced because of their age, but they've made themselves accomplished veterans by the success that they've had and by cashing in in important game situations. And that's the reason why they haven't been down in this series so far. And Rutgers also a young team to its own point, and especially the pitching staff has had a lot of success so far this season. Just the never ending gauntlet of this lineup is really pushing them to its limit. Yeah, Gamsby, a first-team all-conference pitcher back home in California. And has become an instant weekend starter for Rutgers, trying to avoid further damage. And Copeland fouls it back. Gamsby trying to get the chase. Smart pitch high up in the zone there. And I love the term game leader because it also implicitly implies that 
it can be a different person in every game. Well, it has been. And it's been Sarah Stone, but the only reason she's in those RBI situations is because the Bassets, the Kearns, and the Minnicks on are getting on base in front of her. The one, two. This is popped up to right. Bach comes charging in, and it's Lawson out, makes the catch, and forces Kern to stay at third. Well done by Maddie Lawson. Getting the ball in quickly, and it's an unproductive second out. Yeah, that is exactly what Ramey Gamsby needed. I thought that had enough juice on it to make it to right field, but it really died in the air. And Mentioned she's been red hot in Big Ten play, but she chases off speed there. Strike one. And it seems like Gamsby has had Indiana off balance these last couple of at-bats. Definitely. And this was another theme we saw yesterday, too. It truly felt like there were one or two times when an Indiana pitcher swung at a ball outside the zone. So for Gansby to be establishing that early is very important. Hammered foul. But it's 0-2. And it's just, it's, it's unbelievable how quickly, of course, because a lot of Indiana's struggles in their, in their losing skid were, because they weren't putting together good at bats, how quickly they flipped that on its head. And that has been the absolute number one reason why they have had so much success offensively in this series is because they are working these at bats to perfection and forcing pitchers to throw what they want. Parker into the gap, Smith tracking it, makes the catch on the run. And Ramey Gamsby out of trouble in the top of the third. It was bases loaded, nobody out. Indiana does score one. in its hair this Sunday afternoon. That's because Taylor found out before yesterday's game that her grandfather, who we're told she was very close to, passed away yesterday. Uh, so of, co of course we send our thoughts to the Minnick family. Uh, talking to Shonda Stanton before today's game, she said Taylor Minnick wanted to play yesterday, was sort of persistent to play yesterday, and that's been a great weekend for the sophomore. Yesterday was on base three times, scored a run, drove in another. Uh, and even despite everything she's gone through this weekend and the tough news she's received, softball's sort of been her sanctuary these last couple of days, and nice to see her teammates honoring her and sort of rallying in support of her. Absolutely. A wonderful gesture there. Shonda Stanton mentioning that she had already won before the game even started by wanting to be out there, showing up for her teammates, and, of course, honoring her grandfather by being on the field, something that he loved watching her doing. So thoughts and prayers with her family and so many different offensive categories. They're on pace to set new records for the most home runs, RBIs. And as the three hitter, she's right in the middle of all of that. But good start for this Rutgers offense here in the third, drawing the first walk in two days. Calista Collins setting the table here for Ryan Orange. Yeah, that's the goal for Rutgers today is just salvage this series, get closer to 500 in league play. Now Kirsten with Stanley running for Callista Collins at first, and now she's standing on second as Ryan Orange cracks a single. So two get on base for Rutgers, and now the top of the order is up. And with speed on the base pass and with Stanley, a really good opportunity to do so. And Sand Buns, that is a fair ball. The throw to first, she's safe. Warwick waited on it for a moment, but it stayed inside the chalk. Sand beats it out, and Rutgers loads the bases. The tying run now on as well. That split second of hesitation by Warwick, hoping that it would go foul, gave Sand that one extra step. She already has so much speed, but look at her get out of the box. And just literally that split second, and Sand gets in there. Now a huge opportunity here for Peyton Linkavage to cash in and put Rutgers on the board for the first time since Friday. And Rutgers really, excuse me, Dom, they really haven't lost any of their energy. You saw Megan Herka come out, give some encouraging words to the bottom of the lineup, and now the, the bench is really starting to get into it. And Linkavage puts that back to the pitcher, the flip home, and they get the lead out. Well handled by Montgomery on the scramble. With Stanley is retired, but everybody advances. 
And it'll be the same situation with one out for Morgan Smith. And Rutgers hoping it can do something here. And Morgan Smith steps out of the way of it. Oh no, she was hit. A delayed call, but she was plunked. And so Rutgers scores a run. Orange is in, everybody advances. RBI's an RBI. That'll go down in the stat book. It's just as good as a hit. Try and tie this game, at least get back into it. And with so many opportunities, as Katie Winger is frustrated, thinking Macy Montgomery just fast pitched her a little bit there. Yeah, and then in the end, it was called the ball. I think nobody content with how that played out. And Wingert slams this into the gap. It'll go for extra bases. Sand is in. Lynn Cavage behind her. Wingert now headed to second. The throw, she's safe. The ball game is tied. On three hits and in search of more is the pitch to Maddie Lawson is fouled off for strike one. But the new pitcher is Heather Johnson. We told you she was dynamite yesterday and highly efficient as well. Showing through 46 pitches. So she comes in here trying to preserve the tie now with two in scoring position. Absolutely, and Indiana is going back to what worked so well yesterday, which was Heather Johnson in the circle, but already the situations are drastically different because Johnson is coming in with runners on the base path, which truly just didn't happen much at all yesterday for Rutgers offense. Lawson sends this to left, drifting back. Parker makes the catch, but it's long enough for Morgan Smith to score. And for the first time this weekend, Rutgers has a lead. Contact has been so important for Rutgers all weekend long, and that's perfect. <laughs> Playing off some well-placed hits, good contact, and Rutgers now holds the lead. Rutgers has scored more runs in this third inning than they had in the first two games combined. And now Fawcett shoots this out to left. Parker again crossing by Mitchell, and it's Kenzie Mitchell that cuts over to make the play. Ooh, that could have been dangerous for Indiana, but it's the end of the inning. Well, still, it's the inning of the weekend for Rutgers offense. And now Ramey Gamsby pitches with the lead as she faces the bottom third of Indiana's order. Trying to navigate through this and provide the shutdown inning that it feels like Rutgers could really use. Absolutely, Rutgers offense definitely exercising, exercising some demons there. Bottom of the third inning and for the first time this series, a Rutgers pitcher is also pitching with the lead. So some much needed rest for Gamsby, a reset, and now she has the lead. Sigh of relief and is looking for her second one, two, three inning of the afternoon. Now you see the pinch hitter, Abby Meeks, batting for Lindsey Warwick with Kinsey Mitchell and Brooke Benson due up after. And a count two and one. Now Gamsby has this sort of emotional makeup to perform in these kinds of situations. That's what everybody around this Rutgers softball program has told us all season long about her. And she's unfazed. This is blasted to center field, but Morgan Smith gets to it. A couple of long flyouts for both teams today as Meeks is retired. Yeah, there actually hasn't, there's been one ground out and a few bumps, but no ground outs for this Indiana team. They've been aloft in the ball in the air. It's just been weak enough that the outfielders have been able to get into underneath it, but Ramey Gansby has been a fighter all season long, forcing these opposing hitters to fight off the stuff they don't want. And she's been successful so far today. And starts out Kinsey Mitchell with strike one. Now Gansby is an interesting, interesting student athlete. Pitches sort of emotionless in the circle. Now, Kristen Butler said nothing phases her. And she joked to us earlier in the year that it's sort of a game. Can we get Ramey to, to laugh or flash a smile when she's in the circle in big situations? 
This is somebody, though, who is majoring in biomedical engineering. Not what I majored in here. <laughs> Certainly not. And balancing that is a weekend starter for Rutgers. That bunts a fair ball, and the out is made. It's quick snap by Katie Winger. You see Kinsey Mitchell's got all the speed in the world, but she's retired. Yeah, that, that was going to be a bang-bang play anyway, but a really nice jump from Winger there behind the plate the and doesn't the hesitate six. for a second. Brooke. Able to throw out Mitchell at first base. And that's huge because obviously Gamsby is looking for this one, two, three inning, but just to eliminate any opportunities for this lineup to turn over with runners on base slash in scoring position is, is essential for Rutgers. And at this point, now that they've established momentum on the offensive side, they want to get back into the dugout as quickly as possible and swing to that again. A one. Benson, pop up. Sand is out to find it. And once again, the bottom third of the order retired by Gamsby. One, two, three. The shutdown inning that Rutgers needed. The Scarlet Knight bats come back to the plate when we come back. Finding gaps and almost turning the lineup over, which is exactly what this Rutgers offense needed. Yeah, eight Scarlet Knights came to the plate in the third inning. The only one who didn't is Kayla Bach starting it out here. And foul tips that. This is still Heather Johnson, by the way, who came in to get the final two outs of the third inning. And we'll see how long she's expected to go. Indiana is one of those teams in the conference that has a pretty quick hook notoriously. Not in a bad way, but very willing to go to other pitchers. Uh, Bach rolls this to second, Kern charging in. And Johnson did allow one inherited runner to score, but she's also retired all three she's faced so far. And now Kirsten with Stanley. This was her first plate appearance after pinch running for Callista Collins in the last inning. Strike one pitch. And Heather Johnson building off of what she did yesterday. Now it's remarkable with Johnson's performance in particular how things have changed. A mid-season lull and she's emerged from it. As with Stanley taps this to third and it's a couple of outs on the ground for Johnson to quickly speed through this bottom of the fourth are looking as good as they did on Friday, Saturday. This truly looks like a team that can compete for the long haul. The goal for Indiana this year is, at least most immediately, is a buy in the Big Ten tournament. They want to finish top four in the conference. And there's a team-wide realization as Oren shoots this to right. A charging play by Bassett to end the inning all within two, three games of each other. So it's going to come down. Really, both teams have the opportunity to control based on what they do. And Shonda Stanton mentioned pregame that you don't often get the opportunity to do that. So it's going to be on Rutgers to win when they can, win at home. They have a, a tough series against Northwestern to close out the regular season. But they'll be looking to make as much noise as possible come Big Ten tournament time. Indiana, by virtue of its two wins thus far this weekend, is pulled into a tie with Nebraska for second place. Of course, last weekend, Nebraska handled Indiana, a series sweep. But there's a tiny bit of space between Michigan, the number four team, the last team with a bye as it stands right now, and Minnesota and Wisconsin tied for fifth. The difference is two games in the win column, that's it. But also, between Minnesota and fifth place, as Cora Bassett smashes this to center field off the top of the wall, barely missed a home run. The throw to second, she's safe. Oh, Bassett just beat it out. The range of emotions. Almost a tie game, and then almost an out at second. But the tying run in scoring position to start the fifth. Yeah, line drives are coming in bunches for this Indiana lineup. 
That was played perfectly off the wall by Morgan Smith. You saw her immediately stop running because she knew if that didn't get out, that it would come right back to her. Great slide by Bassett, beating it out just by the length of her hand. Nice throw from Smith to get it into second base quickly. Yeah, I think the difference between a home run and that double and the difference between safe and out were the same. Yeah, <laughs> Not a definitely. lot. And now Taryn Kern at the plate. And as that one flies outside, it looked like Rutgers was trying to intentionally walk Kern there. Now they are. Winger set up in the opposite batter's box. Not even crouching here. Now you can see Gamsby maybe not used to doing this, having to throw these four intentional pitches out of the zone. And just to emphasize how rare this is to be intentionally walking a hitter with Taylor Minnick coming up after her. Sarah Stone with seven RBIs on the weekend coming up behind her with no outs in this inning. So Kern is obviously a hitter that Rutgers just wants absolutely nothing to do with. So Kern, who homered earlier today, is put on base. But that means the go-ahead run is on with nobody out. Of course, you do get to force it all three bases. As Taylor Minnick, two walks today for her, strolls to the plate. Pitch from Gamsby. Oh, she hit her. Base is loaded. Trying to work inside on Minnick and instead puts her on. You have to wonder now if that intentional walk does any sort of, puts Gamsby through some mental hoops just because she is, is so unfazed normally and that one goes off of the knee of Minnick, that front knee, or excuse me, that back knee as, as a lefty there. But now base is loaded, no outs. Sarah Stone, it continues to happen. The RBI queen this weekend. Has another opportunity. Third time in the series that Sarah Stone has come to the plate with the bases loaded and nobody out. And she's got four RBI in the first two spots. And checks this over to second. Lawson traps it. That's a, f a ball that's down. So the out at first. The run scores. Lawson dropped it. Bassett's in. The game is tied. Wow. Definitely an odd sequence of events there. That check swing by Stone. Definitely did not even attempt to swing out at the full way, but it just pops out of the glove of Lawson here at second as we take a look. Yeah, she had her glove under it, and then at the last second it comes out. She had the wherewithal to still throw it over to first base. She probably had a chance at second also because the runners did have to freeze, but with the bases loaded, run able to score from third base. So. Once again, Indiana showing that they don't need that ball over the fence to score runs. Oh, now we've got time because the first pitch that Copeland saw was fouled off the home plate umpire, Donald Postel. It seemed as if, as Maddie Lawson leaned forward to secure the ball, it's when it sort of rolled its way out. Notable too, because if she hangs on to it, Cora Bassett seemed like was four or five steps down the line. A quick throw could have doubled her up and completely changed this inning. Absolutely. Yeah, weird sequences like that where it takes a lot of smart base runners, and I think Maddie Lawson will be kicking herself for not just throwing that second hand over because she was underneath it. So it's Kern at third, Minnick at second, and Copeland at the plate with one out. And now loops this to short and send, traps it. Throw back to third, everybody's safe. Now that time, Sand was a foot shy of the ball, and Kern brightly didn't move a muscle. Yeah, what an, what an odd sequence of events these two plays. That one is jammed. 
Sand just misses it on the bounce, but is able to get her body in front of it, obviously. And like you mentioned, Kern, if she had been two steps off that bag, Sand immediately threw over to first base, so she would have been doubled up there. But two straight plays. Gamsby's pitches are obviously working. She gets check swing by Stone. That leads to an out. And then jams Copeland that leads to an or That one didn't lead to an out, but at least didn't score a run. And now she does have the chance here to elicit some more weak contact, but base is loaded for Avery Parker. Here come the freshmen, zone one. That rides high. Gamsby has been put through it by the top six of this Indiana order today. And she's about to throw her 100th pitch. High in the sky. This could be playable. Fawcett over there and can't glove it. Wow, she had to range a long way for that one. She was almost there. Uh, and in the end, it's, it's probably a good thing that Fawcett couldn't catch that. Of course, the at-bat continues, but if she does catch it, at the very least, one run scores. It looks like it might have even graced the glove there, too, but so much momentum going into that wall. This is one of those tough innings, too, where Gamsby feels like she's doing everything she can. She's eliciting weak contact. She's throwing good pitches, and still, Indiana's threatening. One, two. And still, Indiana isn't swinging at any pitches out of the zone, and that's why Gamsby's pitch count, that's why Vickers' pitch count was so high after these outings through just three, four innings. Because Indiana works such tough at bats every single time, one through nine in the lineup. Now a 2-2. Two -two. And Parker lines this to left. Fawcett charges to make the play. It will score the go-ahead run, though, as Kern is in on the sacrifice fly. Oh no, Kern left early. They double her up at third. Chris and Butler came charging out of the dugout, pointing at the third base bag. Fawcett through there, and the third base umpire, John Schaefer, said Taryn Kern left the base early, trying to tag up, inning over. You're absolutely right there. The coaching staff knew right away, based on that replay, you can just see the, the helmet, really. You can't really see from either angle what the other is doing. Right. But just from the body language, that yeah, she's just on the base for a long time, and Link Havage is ready to receive the throw. That's what I, exactly what I was going to say, that Link Havage puts her arms up after Kern has Oh, left. what a catch. It's short now. The fielders have come to play on Sunday. Brooke Benson with a leaping snag. Wow, that was unbelievable, especially the speed at which it came off the bag. That ball was behind her when she made that catch. Wow, just as far as that wingspan would give her. Show of emotion. And Alan Cavage drives it to right, and the catch is made by Bassett. <laughs> And a whole lot of fun for the head coaches of these programs as well. Kristen Butler at Rutgers, Shonda Stanton at Indiana. These two go back quite a ways. Now, I mentioned that earlier that Shonda Stanton was a coach in the NPF for several years. And in fact, she coached Kristen Butler when Butler was playing for the Akron Racers for two seasons back in 2007 and 2008. So they've known each other for the better part of two decades. Well, they've talked a whole lot this weekend. We've seen them in conversation pregame and after games. I can only imagine. Yeah, I can only imagine the amount of uh, uh, emotion and the, the chirping too going on between those two. Oh, absolutely. As we see their teams go play for play. Especially if Rutgers is able to get this one here in a crazy sequence of events. I mean, people say that basketball is a game of runs. This has felt like a game of runs in terms of momentum shifts. Obviously, a huge offensive inning for Rutgers, and then. Indiana is 
just about to do the same thing. Controversial call, some great defense, and then in the top, uh, or excuse me, in the bottom of the fifth, Indiana just completely takes out any any chance of Rutgers putting a rally together. Now Shonda Stanton said that Kristen Butler hit one of the longest home runs she's ever seen. It was back when she was coaching Butler in the pro leagues. She said we, we were playing the U.S. Olympic team and it was a close game early and Butler hit a ball, I don't know, 400 feet or so, she said. Now that runs in and hits Lindsey Warwick to begin the sixth inning. Now Stanton did concede that you know, the U.S. Olympic team did come back and ended up getting <laughs> run rolled in that game. You see the hit by pitch on the Evo Shield. Butler doesn't remember it that way. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure she's just worried about the home run. Now, Butler, too, credits Shonda Stanton for for being a, a not just a good coach, but a good manager, she was saying. And really it's high cool. ball game. It's also nice to see leagues like Athletes Unlimited gain some steam more opportunities for women to play on a professional level. Yeah, agreed in several sports. Now right now these two teams are just looking for a W in what's been the hardest fought game of the weekend. This is exactly the type of battle that Rutgers needed to show on game three of the series. On their home turf, of course, too. Alumni weekend. And Kinsey Mitchell guides that back through the middle. Two runners are on base for Indiana as the bottom of their order for the first time today produces. Yeah, this is where Ramey Gamsby has really succeeded in this lineup. Two, one, two, three the innings. One strikeout, a couple pop flies, a couple balls to the outfield, but that just felt like the quintessential lefty slap hitter ball up the middle and now Benson has a chance after making a phenomenal defensive play last inning to cash in on the offensive side here. Benson pops it up, and it hit her helmet, so it's a foul ball. Ricocheted off the bat, then her helmet, and immediately that ball's dead. Now corners are halfway into home plate. But the bunt goes back to the pitcher. Linkavage throws it to first, and the sacrifice is, succe is successful. So Andrews goes to third, Mitchell to second, and as Cora Bassett comes to the plate, this is a prime opportunity for Indiana to get two runs, not only just claim the lead. Cora Bassett has had some really nice swings today, scored two over three times, two straight hits. Looks like Butler will go to the pen here for the top of the lineup. Yeah, Ramey Gamsby is able to avoid reaching or facing the top of this Indiana lineup, but Vickers obviously yesterday had her fair share of the top of the lineup. Was given the loss, brought her to 9-6 on the season in just over two innings of work. Again, gave up just those three hits, but five walks. And you can see why she is, Kristen Butler put Vickers in the circle in this spot in the game. She is trying to get as many swings and misses as she can, and that's something she's done all season long. And it starts out Cora Bassett with a few out of the zone. Yeah, Vickers entered yesterday and some, playing some of the best softball of her career, frankly. They were her best stretch in Big Ten play ever, and we've seen a lot of her in four seasons at Rutgers. Trying to rebound from that performance quickly. Infield's in as a 2-0 sizzles over the plate. And this is a great opportunity to do so. Tie game, Indiana obviously threatening with two runners in scoring position, just one out in the inning, top of the lineup. Cora Bassett, again, a single and a double scored both times. First opportunity today, though, for her that she's had runners on. She smoked one to right center fielder last time up. 2-1. That's fouled off. And I think going from Ramey Gansby to Jaden Vickers is a nice wrinkle that Rutgers is able to use. Tough for the opposing lineup because they both bring the speed, but Vickers doesn't use that off-speed stuff as often. Switch up the timing a little bit because Indiana had to change their timing for Gansby's off-speed stuff. 
A 2-2 fastball misses low. Well, of course, waiting on deck is Taryn Kern, the best hitter in the conference. So even with first base open, you don't think Vickers will approach this payoff pitch thinking that. Here it comes, and it's ball four. Bassett stays away from the low heat, and Taryn Kern has the chance to change the game once again. She was intentionally walked her last time up, is now up before she was intentionally walked because first base was open. That is not the case in this inning, and once again, as Shonda Stanton mentioned in her words, Indiana is winning the, quote, freebie war. Taking pitches outside of the zone. Taylor Kern obviously has supplied the power, but otherwise Indiana is getting it done in different ways. And Vickers starts her out with an inside strike. That's where Rutgers has been trying to work. Inner half or outside black. Avoid most of that outer half of the plate with the Big Ten's most prolific home run hitter this season. Runners at every base. As that rides high. Only twice this weekend has Taryn Kern been retired, but Jaden Vickers was the pitcher for both of those. They faced each other three times yesterday, a strikeout, a ground out, and a hit by pitch. 1-1. It hit her! Vickers trying to work inside, hit Kern on the hand. She's pleading her case that Kern was over the plate, but the run scores. That's Andrews, and Indiana is back in front. Yeah, you can see Vickers is visibly frustrated as Butler comes out here. That Kern was over the plate and also made no move to get out of the way. And you have seen umpires call that before. Stuck out her arm a little bit, but it's hard to differentiate those moves there. But she knew, yeah, Vickers wanted it right away. Has the chance to provide insurance. And of course, that's the last thing Vickers wants to do, come in and, and hit a batter, especially a batter like Kern. But that's our second RBI hit by pitch today. Yeah. <laughs> Taylor Minnick, another one, got hit in the knee last time up. Rutgers has faced these type of situations defensively so far today and, of course, throughout the series because of the type of runs Indiana has, been, has put on the board. So... They need a little bit more magic to get out of this one. Minnick gets under it, pops it up. There's with Stanley called off by Lawson, and she makes the play. So Minnick is retired for the second out of the inning. And that's a really important out there again because there's no movement on the base pass. Similar to last inning at least, didn't have enough on it to get all the way to right field where the runner on third, Kinsey Mitchell, could have scored a ton of speed from Mitchell on third base, but that one just didn't have enough on it. And for the third time <laughs> in this game, and for seemingly the 15th time this weekend, Sarah Stone has another RBI opportunity. Yeah, it does feel that way. Stone, fly ball with Stanley again, called off by Lawson, and it's a couple of fly outs for Vickers to leave the bases loaded in the top of the sixth. But Taryn Kern knows how Rutgers wants to pitch her this weekend. Indiana led early, Rutgers responded with four runs in the bottom of the third inning to grab the lead. But a run in each of the last two frames for the Hoosiers to tie and retake the advantage. Indiana won fairly comfortably each of the first two days, but what a game this has been. The hitters have worked out some good at bats, some timely hits. The pitchers at points have been unhittable, and some of the defensive plays we've seen have been five-star. Absolutely, yeah, some phenomenal defensive plays from both sides. A lot of diving on this sunny afternoon. Something you probably wouldn't expect based on the scores from the first two games is that Indiana has actually closed really well. Rutgers was on the, the verge of a comeback in game one, and Indiana shut that door quickly, and then yesterday, with the chance to shorten the game by a run rule, Indiana was also able to score in the top of the fifth to close out that game. So the Hoosiers are trying to pad their run total as much as they possibly can to eliminate a chance for a Rutgers walk-off in the bottom of the seventh. 3-0 from Jaden Vickers, and she flies it over the plate for strike one.
And it's been a really well-fought game from both sides. Heather Johnson has come in and been unbelievable, shutting down any momentum that Rutgers gained off of Macy Montgomery. And then on the flip side, Indiana hitters just haven't let up. <laughs> Top of the zone strike. You saw Copeland begin her walk to first base. Ooh, that looked to be in a very similar position to some of the ones we saw from Heather Johnson just a half inning ago. Vickers, swing and a miss. Sets down Bree Copeland after what could have been ball four and a big first out to start the seventh for the graduate student. And that is exactly what number Vickers number is out for, for out there for. Absolute Avery gas Parker. from number nine. She got the luck of the call and just blew that one by. Copeland had shortened up anyway, choked up on the bat, and still wasn't able to get through the zone quick enough. So now Avery Parker, and she pushes this up the first baseline foul. And it might not seem like it, but there actually have been a ton of missed opportunities for Indiana in this game. They've ba loaded the bases multiple times. They've left runners on base in all but two innings so far today. So Rutgers defense really showing up behind both Gamsby and Vickers late in these last few innings. That's a good point. First six innings at the plate, Indiana stranded eight base runners. And five of those have been in scoring position. Indiana has just one hit with runners in scoring position today, in fact. So it's been a, a day where they've had to rely on some of the dinks and, and dunks. A sacrifice fly drove in a run. The hit by pitch of Taryn Curran in a sixth drove in what stands as the possible winning run right now. All right. So they're still putting together quality at bats, just coming in different ways than you might expect from this really good offensive team. Uh, now it's a two and two count against Parker, who is hitless today, but does have a walk. Well, with Rutgers' struggles to score this weekend, it feels like Vickers has to keep this in a one-run game. And her 2-2, that flies high. She's definitely targeting that part of the zone, but just time and time again, Indiana is not chasing at that pitch. She hasn't thrown that true off-speed pitch yet totally freezes up some batters that we saw yesterday. The payoff. This is down the right field line. Foul. By the way, this is pretty remarkable just to add to Indiana's inability to cash in on chances. The only hit that the Hoosiers have with the runners in scoring position today was that odd Bree Copeland single back in the fifth inning with runners on second and third. Or Kylie Sand tried to make a diving catch, trapped it, and neither runner advanced. It's the only one. Full count pitch. And Key again. part there is that none of the runners advanced. Yep. Yeah, no RBI hits in those runners in scoring position situations today for Indiana. And meanwhile, on the other side, Rutgers did all of its damage thus far in the third inning. The battle continues. It's checked to first and with Stanley gloves it, two away. Another jammed at bat that Vickers has produced. Just nailing that inside corner, getting a ton of weak contact to the right side as well. The, left fielder, the speed seven, that, at which she's throwing is Andrews. causing these hitters to struggle getting their bat through the zone. Yeah, I mean, despite the score, 5-4, I'm sure Gamsby didn't 
trot off the field super excited by her performance, but based on how good this Indiana offense has been and how good they were prior games in this series with runners in scoring position, I think both pitchers have to be at least content with how they were able to limit this Indiana offense today. Strike one pitch to Leah Andrews is laced to left field, and that's down for a single. A two-out knock extends the top of the seventh inning. And it gives Indiana a chance to add some much-needed insurance. Now batting the center fielder, number 24. And we say it every Kinsey inning, but this is Mitchell. where Vickers needs to get this final out here, either in Kinsey Mitchell, who we've seen lay down a bunt with the speed that she possesses on the left side of that box, or get Brooke Benson, who's 0 for 3, over two with a sack on the day before that lineup turns over to Cora Bassett and any more damage could be done. Well, if you want to peer ahead to the bottom of the seventh inning, Rutgers is due to bring Kirsten with Stanley, Ryan Orange, and Kylie Sands to the plate. That's eight, nine, and one. Rutgers had been readying a pinch hitter for with Stanley before the sixth inning ended. This is popped up. Sand tracking it and into foul territory makes the play. Top of the seventh, over. Untouchable this weekend. Yeah, just that one walk otherwise truly has been nearly perfect with such a low pitch count as well. Something Indiana has done some so well all weekend is not swinging at pitches outside of the zone and she's gotten a lot of Rutgers hitters to chase so far. This is Lauren Punk pitch hitting for Kirsten with Stanley. I mentioned a moment ago that with Stanley, it looked like it was going to be pinch hit four. If she had a chance to swing in the sixth, then it was Punk who was getting ready. The junior infielder who has some pop in her bat. Yeah, this is a great decision here by, by Coach Butler. And with Ryan Orange on deck, she's seen time at the top of the lineup so far this season. She has a hit so far today and some strong contact to right field as well. So truly the, the second leadoff spot there that can provide some boost before Sand comes up. Wow. And Punk crashes a foul ball home run up to the berm and left. That was smoked. And that is why Lauren Punk is up in this situation. Just ahead of it there. Really turned on that pitch well, and you can see power on her pull side. Heather Johnson's going to want to stay away from the inside corner. And tries outside, but Punk won't go fishing. It's three and two. Here's a big payoff. And Punk grounds it to short. Benson scoops it up. Nice stretch by Stone to record out number one. Has been slowed a little bit lately as she's entered the thick of Big Ten play, but still hitting better than 300. Yeah, and that's why you've seen her move up and down the lineup a little bit, but it does just, it provides an advantage for Rutgers to have hitters like this where they can place anywhere and still be effective. 2-0. Oh. This inning especially, we've seen the game plan trying to swing early and often against Heather Johnson. She's throwing some balls out of the zone, which is automatically lengthening these at-bats, but you see Rutgers hitters being much more patient and with their last chance here, they're going to have to be just that. Does the freshman Orange get a green light on 3-0 if Johnson gives her something to hit? Let's see. No. Yeah, that Take strike one. That would have surprised me there, especially in this situation, down one in the last inning with Kylie Sand on deck. No use risking it. The lefty deals. And Orange flips it, Stone charging, she dropped it. Oh, she had it in her mitt. Sarah Stone would have had the best catch on an otherwise outstanding fielding day and just could not hang on. Yeah, just a ton of spin there. You see she actually ended up overrunning it a little bit based on that spin. It, just like a similar play that, that Maddie Lawson made at second base. She had her glove underneath and it just popped up on impact. The payoff. Foul back. Ryan Orange working a good at bat here, which is all that 
Kristen Butler is asking of her team in this inning. Everybody here knows how effective Heather Johnson has been this weekend. It's just about fouling off all the good stuff, waiting for that good pitch to hit, and not giving her any help by swinging at any pitches outside of the zone. Another 3-2. This is smoke to center field, but it's right at Kinsey Mitchell. Again, Orange crushes it. But Rutgers now down to its final out as Kylie Sand comes to the plate. She just has to set the table for Peyton Lankavich, who sits taking some swings in the on-deck circle. And Kylie Sand takes ball one. Well, this is not the first time that Copeland and Sand meet this weekend. Mentioned Copeland got the win Friday. In three meetings, Sand was two for three with a couple singles and two runs scored. And that's ball two. Yeah, that one just missed on the inside corner. It's definitely looking inside on Sand here, try and jam her, elicit some weak contact. And that's on the inside corner, two and one. By the way, the new right fielder as Bassett goes from right to third is Tatum Hayes. Now she makes her first appearance of the weekend. A Copeland just got it, looking for the final out. She bobbles the throw, gets it over to first. The series is over. It's a series sweep for Indiana. They take all three games in New Jersey and hang on to the Sunday nail-biter by the final of 5-4. to four. It's a big turnaround weekend for the Hoosiers.